Well, it is uh, two o'clock and um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I can't get my video to work now, so <laughs> just hear my uh, voice in the background. But I want to welcome everyone uh, for joining us today uh, for our webinar on aquatic wetland butterfly gardening. Uh, my name is Stacy Matrazo. I'm the executive director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Uh, if you're not familiar with our organization, our mission is to connect, protect, and expand native wildflower habitats through our education, research, planting, and conservation programs. And our work is made possible primarily through the sale and renewal of the Florida State Wildflower License Plate. And whether you've got the old look, which you see here, or our new look, you are supporting our work and we thank you very much. These funds, along with donations and memberships, allow us to support and create projects that build awareness and knowledge of native wildflowers and plants throughout Florida. And I'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing the state wildflower license plate. Be sure to check out our website for resources on planting and growing wildflowers, um, to learn where to see wildflowers in bloom, um, upcoming events and more. We're also on all the social media, so um, you can find us on most platforms at FLA Wildflowers. Uh, our next webinar um, is on April 20th. Dr. Sandy Wilson of the University of Florida will discuss underutilized native ornamental plants. And then in May, we'll feature Sarah Weaver on uh, native bees. We also have uh, field trips coming up. If you're in South Florida, we will be exploring the Miami Dunes ecosystem on April 16th. And on April 30th, we uh, will be visiting a working wildflower farm in the Gainesville area. So again, everything, uh, information is on our website. Um, check that out to uh, learn more and to register. And then in conjunction with today's topic, I'm happy to announce the release of our new handout, Aquatic Wildflowers for Pollinators, which is now available on our website. Um, and we'll be sending out a resource page at the end uh, or after this webinar. So uh, there'll be a link to this handout as well where you'll be able to view it and download it. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping items. Um, all attendees are muted and your cameras are off. We are recording the webinar and it will be available on our website and our YouTube channel in about 24 hours. We'll also include a link to it when we send you that follow-up email after uh, today's event. If you have questions during the presentation, um, please use the Q&A feature. You can enter your question at any point and uh, we will um, address what we can at the end of Sean's talk. And. Um, Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Sean Patton is an aquatic biologist and uh, founder of Stocking Savvy, Savvy, excuse me, a habitat restoration and environmental consulting business. Um, having been disillusioned by the traditional costly and permanent and ineffective environmental management systems within the private sector, Sean began researching alternative methods for restoring Florida's landscapes to their most balanced and natural forms. Now, Sean utilizes naturally occurring biological systems and native plant and wildlife species to restore habitat across the state. Welcome, Sean, and thank you. And thank you, Stacy, for that introduction. Let's go ahead and jump right into the presentation. All right. So I have been working in this field for over six years and running my company for um, four of those years. And we have worked in a wide variety of ecosystems, everything from your standard retention pond to new developments, to seepage bogs and preserves and natural habitats, to invasive species and algae pits. So we've seen the whole spectrum. And the main thing that we wanna do is to have a nice, healthy ecosystem with a variety of native wetland plants. There are thousands of native plants in Florida, 400 of which are found nowhere else on earth. And I've modified this presentation to be a little bit more focused on the wildflowers, but there's a huge diversity of trees, shrubs, flowers, ferns, rushes and reeds, 
and of course, submerged plants, which we're actually going to talk a little bit about in this presentation, as many of those submerged plants will send flowers up to the surface to be pollinated and can actually be important pollinator species and habitat. And also there are some varieties and cultivars of native plants, such as white pickerel weed, very rare to occur in the wild and is also an uncommon site. Heleniums and you know your sneeze weeds, lizard's tail, one of the very few full shade flowering larger plants in Florida, excellent pollinator plant. The Sagittaria is very commonly used, but many people don't realize how many there are. And while many of you up north might not like them, smart weeds are actually very good pollinator plants and also good in disturbed areas to help restore a habitat quickly. So the very first thing we need to cover is what actually defines wetland ecosystems. And it really depends on who you're talking to. And so we kind of go by this method where it's based on the water levels and the watermark and the average you know, depth and moisture of the water. Upland is anything that's nearby a water body, but is not underwater unless it's a hundred year flood or a, you know, flooding events. This is where you'll see a lot of animal, uh, sorry, a lot of plants that might have roots extending into the water, but they're far enough away that they're not in the water. They don't have wet feet. And so you'll see um, maples go from the upland to the riparian zone. And many of these species will have several zones they sit in. One key fact that you always need to know about aquatic gardening is that many plants can grow shallower, but they cannot grow too deep. Eelgrass, for instance, and a lot of the tape grass species I've seen grow in mud, but if they're too deep and they don't get enough light, they'll die. The same thing with elderberry. It can grow in the riparian zone, but if you put it in the emergent, it'll die, but it'll do fine in the upland. And so if you're ever worried about your plant species and you're doing some aquatic gardening for the first time, always plant it shallower than you think, especially if it's a young plant. And many plants rely on this moving of the water. And so we'll really dive into that movement in a second. But notice how the riparian zone has all the most beautiful wildflowers. This is the number one thing that's not in any retention pond. They go straight from an upland to an emergent zone and there's a two foot drop. So when you skip the riparian zone, you skip most of your wetland flowers and most of your wildflowers. You're also more prone to erosion, erosion issues. You're prone to more water quality issues because all the water running off the upland area is not being filtered. And this is just the best section of the pond, in my opinion, and of most wetland environments. In fact, most wetlands, bogs, grasslands are entirely riparian. Um, there are many ecosystems that are riparian with maybe some emergent spots or some littoral spots or maybe some drier spots, but most of our moisture ecosystems tend to fall in this zone where they might be occasionally inundated or they'll have permanently wet feet or seasonally wet feet. And this is really what you want to look for in a habitat, areas that have a lot of this water movement. So some best management practices for stormwater ponds, and I'm tr trying to use local examples um, this is in Sarasota. This actually is one of the better retention ponds, and this is a littoral shelf. It's an area intentionally left shallow for plants to grow. They are supposed to be two feet deep. I've seen them anywhere from 10 feet deep to upland areas called littoral shelves. So technically by law, they're supposed to be two feet deep, but I've seen a lot of variability. And you want the slow sloping into the pond. You also want one or two deep central pools if you can manage them. Not only does this help reduce algae growth in places where plants might not otherwise be growing, keep in mind most aquatic plants, except for lily pads and submerged plants, like to grow in two feet or less. Very few plants can grow deeper than that. And so if you have a three foot bottom and you have no lily pads, no lotuses, no deep water plants, that's the perfect condition for algae blooms. You also wanna keep away wood from outflow areas. This is not really for any environmental reason. It's to prevent your house from flooding because that outflow is what controls a lot of this um, water movement in stormwater ponds. Water can go in, but it cannot come back out. This is also one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of native species in these retention ponds. Fish and um, many plant species and many crayfish and invertebrates back in Florida's history when it was mostly rivers, they would move to new water bodies every time it flooded and the waters would come up. And then in the winter, they would go back down. They would be trapped in these different areas. This doesn't allow any water back in. So many of these retention ponds only have what you stock in it. Only 
only, only use native species in these ecosystems. If you think gardening on land is difficult, gardening in water has a whole different slew of issues. And in fact, most of the top 10 most invasive plants in the world, including the top number one water hyacinth, are all wetland and water and aquatic species. Water really speeds up the ability for plants to travel. And Brazilian pepper also grows well in wetlands. Water hyacinth, hydrilla, water milfoils. Um, oh gosh, there's a whole slew of them. Please do not put these plants in your water bodies. There are many beautiful Florida wetland plants that can substitute just fine. In fact, pickerel weed, one of the most commonly available plants, looks very similar to water hyacinth and it doesn't float around and cause issues. You also wanna regularly maintain invasives. Many people struggle with gardening in their landscape. The opposite is true in a water. Most things will grow very readily as long as they're a wetland species and they're at the right depth. The issue can oftentimes be overgrowth. And this is due to a lot of these stormwater ponds collecting a lot of nutrients or having poor filtration. And so plants will overgrow. This is where you get into people spraying. And I always recommend harvesting rather than spraying because that's a form of nutrient control. If you just spray everything, it rots, turns to algae, and then you have some very, very hard times ahead of you because large algae mats can smother your plants. And we always want to reduce the use of herbicides. They'll hurt the good plants oftentimes just as much as the bad plants with a few specific exceptions like um, cethoxidin, which only targets grasses. So you can safely spray that around other beneficials, but we always want to use herbicides as a last resort. Um, never a first. There are a few invasives that can only be dealt with with herbicides, which is why you can never say get rid of them all. But that is the end goal is to only use this in the case of emergencies. Pesticides, I've never found a reason to use a pesticide. If you're dealing with mosquitoes, midge flies, apple snails, there's a lot of animals that you can actually stock to help prevent their spread. And of course, fertilizer. The main issue is actually reducing growth in a lot of these systems. It's very rare that you actually need to um, promote fertilizer or promote growth. In fact, that usually leads to algae blooms. The challenges of aquatic gardening. The number one, believe it or not, cause of failure in a lot of wetland gardens is that turtle right there. Yeah, you heard me. Cooter turtles are one of the biggest um, issues with water gardening. Um, and right after that is the depth of water. That little turtle right there can eat two to three full-size bare root plants in a heartbeat, in a day or two. They love to eat a lot of plants. They'll take bites out of them. They'll, they're big, big herbivores. 90 to 95% of the diet of those turtles is plants. Soft shells and snappers won't hurt your plants, but that turtle sure will. And so what you need to make sure you're doing is to always overplant a little bit with aquatic gardenings. Um, I personally advise people to not do test sites for lakes and wetlands, because here's the thing. If you have a retention pond with a hundred turtles in it, and it's like a two acre retention pond and you plant a hundred foot strip with a hundred or 200 native plants, those hundred turtles don't have much else to eat in that lake. They will come eat your plants. Second is the depth of water. Ideally, now is the perfect time to plant between May, sorry, between late March to early May is one of the best times to get some of your deeper water plants in while the soil is muddy, um, but they need some time to adjust to the rising water level levels. Again, you can always plant shallower and let plants grow deeper, but if you wanna start off a plant a little deeper, especially in a lot of these retention ponds, which don't have that good riparian zone, you wanna start now. Um, and then the rains will come and really help spur growth. Soil types and sediments are actually a lot less important for aquatic species. Just having that much fresh water tends to bring everything a little closer to neutral. The obvious ex exception being near estuaries and saltwater environments. Make sure your plants are salt tolerant in that case. And you'll actually find that many of Florida's freshwater species can tolerate a few parts per thousand of salt, like minor, minor bits. Um, it's just not for long term. So if you're planting near the coast, if you're planting near an estuary, make sure you're using species that are native to that region. Algae and aquatic weed growth, we've covered this a little bit, but always make sure you're harvesting. Do not spray unless it is a last resort. Because when you spray, plants are released, and then either it fills the water with more algae and herbicide resistant algae, or it, you kill off the plants, you kill off the algae, and then it rains washes all those nutrients out to the Gulf. 
I know we're talking a lot about things that aren't wildflowers, but when you're talking about aquatic gardening, it's really important to talk about a few of these things because they're so important, because these are the reasons why so many aquatic and wetland plantings fail. And then of course, water quality. A lot of these plants actually like poor water quality. It's where they get their nutrients and many plants, especially your cord grasses, your cattails and your bulrushes are really good at filtering out pollutants from the water. In fact, some like a lot of the cord grasses have actually been shown to help reduce heavy metal pollution and they bio sequester and store that in the leaves. So having thick shoreline plantings around ponds and even around wetlands, having buffer areas of a uh, good um, wetland species is very important. Then again, here we can see the ebb and flow. American lotus, which is here, can grow up to eight feet deep in the water, but it prefers to start growing in just four inches. This pickerel weed is oftentimes one of the most commonly planted plants in retention ponds, oftentimes is planted between two, two and a half feet deep. Here we see it growing on bare ground. And you'll notice that many species specifically time the dropping of their seeds or their flowering to this moment. They'll either do it um, at the end of fall or early spring, because a lot of these plants need to land in the mud to grow. The natural rising and falling of the water, it allows so many species to colonize and grow in new areas. I've seen some species do just fine permanently underwater like cypresses. I know of several cypress groves that have been underwater for over 20 years in man-made lakes. No harm to their growth, long-term health is fine, but they'll never reproduce. And so if you want that genetic diversity, you're going to have to do that. And also growing in deeper water can sometimes reduce flowering a little bit just because it's harder to grow. But if you don't have all this area covered, and especially remove as much of your lawn as possible, if you have a big lawn with a sheet of water coming across, that's going to give you a lot more erosion, a lot more pollutants, a lot more um, issues with your water quality. And many of these aquatic plants actually don't grow very well from seed. Canna lilies, American lotus, Heck, even pickerel weed are all actually easier grown rhizomally. And if you have the chance, try to, you can grow them rhizomally. And if you're going to give them to a friend, do it that way. I find that many of these plants are difficult to grow by seed with the exception of a lot of the wildflowers. They can be some of the easiest to grow. Just throw them on mud. And again, of course, this depends on the species. Take that with a grain of salt, but don't put salt in your fresh water. All right. Only plant native. You see this water hyacinth? It looks very similar to the pickerel weed. The only difference is swollen stems and bigger flowers. So you're like, oh, why can't we put this water hyacinth in our lakes? That will cover, one plant will cover a, an acre lake in six months. If a turtle or a gator or even a bird transfers that or some of its seeds, it can absolutely take over. That plant right there is actually what made the first well, what necessitated the making of the first herbicides. Do not move those non-native plants. And I know we're talking to the Florida Wildflower Society, but it's still strictly important. And because of how fast these plants can grow, it's very, very important. But by having these nice, thick native gardens around your lakes and around your ponds, you can help filter nutrients. You can help filter the water before it goes and can start causing algae blooms. And in fact, I have never seen long-term algae issues in plants with water lilies, like fragrant water lily, Mexican water lily, spatterdock, water shield, American lotus. Because they have those big leaves and really shade the water, not only do they cool the water, reducing algae growth, and not only do they compete for nutrients like many other aquatic plants, but they also provide so much cover for fish and invertebrates and the animals that eat the algae, that you tend to get a lot better at natural algae control. So if you're having algae issues in your own lakes or wetlands, try adding some lilies. And if your lake dries out, that's fine. They'll come back from their root system. I've seen spatterdock completely fill up a lake within a week of it being rained. It's very amazing. It'll come from roots to leaves in a fantastic amount of time. So on the left, we see one of the more common filamentous algae mats. You notice it'll start growing up off the bottom and become very nasty. And it's harder to notice and see a harmful algae bloom. Sometimes they're very obvious with blue or green or red streaks in the water, but sometimes they're just, they smell bad. That's usually your first hint. This you can rake out. This is an issue. There are some herbicides that are very bad. Never, ever, ever put copper products in your water. 
Copper is an element, it does not break down. And if applied to a pond over a long enough period of time, plants will stop growing. Um, you will no longer have invertebrates, you'll no longer have plants, it will become essentially a sandy sinkhole. Um, whereas if you do have an emergency and you need to treat with something, there are products like the peroxides, which break down into hydrogen and oxygen and actually don't cause fish kills. Copper products can cause fish kills at label rates. If there's an emergency and you need to do something about a harmful algae bloom in a lake, and yes, this is just like red tide. I've seen red tide-like events in freshwater all the time. Some, most of the time it's from nutrient issues or um, poor herbicide management. And so, yeah, really be careful with the copper. Um, you'll also see pollutants and oils go into the water. And once they're in the water, they're very hard to treat or deal with. And again, that's why it's so important. Many of you might've heard of those no mow zones. They look ugly. Don't do just grass. That's where a lot of invasives are. Do a cool wetland border, whether it's a wildflower border with a lot of like Elliot's love grass and blue stems and sneeze weeds and pink milk weeds and hibiscuses. There's a great variety that you can do. And that's a great thing to put all around your pond or shrubs. If it's a back line of a pond and no one's looking at it, do some shrubs, button bush, wax myrtle, um, cypresses, maples, I mean, trees, anything. Just don't do a turf to the edge. Not only does that not filter your water and make this and this a lot more common, but you're also much more likely to have erosion issues because of that equipment constantly driving around the pond. So one thing that my company focuses on, and this is the what we started off as, is multimodal biological control. And this is simply using complementary native species to reduce the population of your issues. We came up with this idea after treating, I used to be a lake technician. I used to be the guy who would drive around the lakes and clean up algae. I saw that native fish in a lot of my healthiest habitats and turtles were actually just cleaning up the algae as fast as it would grow. But as we talked about earlier with those outfalls, if you don't have those, how are they going to get in there? Fish don't have legs. If anyone puts walking catfish in the comments, I'm going to yell at you. I know they're not native. They're an issue. Yeah, but except for them, fish don't walk to your ponds. Ducks don't drop them in magically. And it's very hard to get fish. And the only fish that are required to be put in new ponds are mosquito fish. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist, and I don't think there are too many in this chat either, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that mosquito fish eat mosquitoes and insects. And most of the most common fish like sunfish and bass don't eat plants either. So we use a variety of native fish, native invertebrates, and even certain species of plants to help control algae and other plant growth. Again, if you have too much algae, if you have too much muck, you're not going to have good care for the native and aquatic plants that you're going to be putting in. So you want things like this golden shiner or flagfish or grass shrimp or native Florida snails um, or copepods. And even a few turtles is fine because again, even the natives can grow sometimes too large or too out of control. And of course, there's a wide variety of birds, butterflies, and even some mammals that can help. The goal in water is very different than on land. On land where things struggle to survive, in water, they thrive. And algae can double its weight every six hours in ideal conditions. Double its weight in six hours. That's insane. That's way more than I had ever put on at the Golden Corral. But with that said, you really need to focus on having a healthy ecosystem if you want to have a good wetland or um, lakeside wildflower garden. And a diversity of plants helps give you seasonal color and um, seasonal variability with many um, aquatic and wetland plants going dormant specifically in the winter because it's the dry season. Though there are some species that bloom year round or will grow year round like the Florida tick seed that can help keep some color in these gardens even when everything else is dormant. These are some of the animals that we work with. There's things like top minnows, pikes, um, native carp. There's also the big grass carp that eat invasive aquatic plants. You need a permit for those, but they're very useful in certain situations and not the um, wild invasive ones from Tennessee. We use sterilized ones that um, just can't reproduce. Otherwise, they're fine, happy fish. You throw them in a lake, they eat a lot of your issues, and they're way better than herbicides the only actual control for hydrilla, and many of these species are aquacultured, and we work on restoring the ecosystem at Stocking Savvy. And now you're like, Sean, I've listened to you talk for 20 minutes. 
and you haven't talked about that many wildflowers yet. We've only seen one slide of them. Well, we're about to get to them. And one of the big things when we're talking about a butterfly garden is there's two different kinds of plants. Now I know you all, most of you will know this, but some people don't. And it happens in every talk I give. If you need a butterfly garden, you need two different kinds of plants. You need the host plants. This is what the baby butterflies eat, the caterpillars. They are generally more restricted, though some moths and uh, very few butterflies are generalists. Just like the monarch butterfly only eats milkweeds or plants in the milkweed family, um, the mangrove skipper only eats red mangroves. And that's a beautiful um, blue and gray, uh, blue, brown and gray butterfly right here. The females can be very colorful. And this is one I saw just a few weeks ago at Feltz Preserve. You need the host plant. In fact, that's what makes the butterflies stay. If you have a butterfly garden with a hundred different pollinator plants, which is what they nectar from, but no host plants, you're not going to see butterflies very often um, because they make their territories around their host plants. They'll fight with other butterflies. They'll fly around and they'll stay in an area with their host plants because that's the territory they defend. So if you want to see more butterflies, or you're just not noticing them, make sure you have their host plants. And since we're talking about aquatic environments, you might be like, well, Sean, caterpillars can't swim. How are they doing this? Well, some caterpillars only are active during the dry season. Uh, many of uh, the bacopa plant, which is a wetland ground cover, is exposed during the dry season. That's when the butterflies tend to lay their eggs and be most active. And that's the peacock butterfly. Mangrove skippers, obviously, they just hold on real tight in the branches or they'll make a little nest up in the tree. And they'll, you know, use their silk and weave leaves together. There's a lot of different characteristics that these butterflies have to survive in wetlands. And wetlands are incredibly important with many butterflies being obligate wetland or obligate aquatic habitat. Mangrove skippers, for example, are only in saltwater mangrove habitat. Um, if you're looking for Brazilian skippers, they only eat canna lilies and fireflag, which are obligate wetland plants. And of course, different butterflies nectar at different plants. The flower size and shape dramatically affects the pollinators you attract. There's a reason when you go to a big box store with a bunch of non-native flowers, you don't see that many butterflies. They don't recognize it as food. It's like, oh, this is colorful. You'll see a lot of European honeybees around. And again, I don't think I need to explain to you all where European honeybees come from. One last thing I wanna talk about most people have no idea what wetland plants they're looking at. And there's a huge variety of rushes, grasses, and reeds that are very hard to identify. Um, I work with the S S Marie Selby Botanical Garden on the uh, Sarasota Manatee Ecoflora Project. It's a local project to identify plants in our area. We've added over 70 to the new list. You just download the app, iNaturalist, and it's free. And you can upload your photos, take good photos, take lots of high quality ones. There's also the Worldwide City Nature Challenge, April 29th to May 2nd. Lots of cities in Florida are participating. It's a great way to get out there and just document as many plants and animals as you can. See how many wildflowers you can collect, compete with your friends. A lot of cities and areas are offering prizes. I know uh, the Sarasota Manatee one is. So check it out. You just need a camera or a smartphone. Look it up. It's on iNaturalist or um, just the Worldwide City Nature Challenge. It's a great way to learn more about the plants and animals around you. And now that we've talked about everything but the wildflowers, let's get into it. So the first wildflower I want to talk about is one that we'll, we'll, we'll start off more familiar. Um, white milkweed is also known as the aquatic milkweed. It's the host of the monarch queen and soldier butterflies, just like all milkweeds. And this is one of the only two milkweeds that blooms and grows year round. You'll oftentimes see these guys in shaded, moist hammocks. Um, Mayaka State Park has a lot of really good examples of white milkweed. And like all milkweeds, they're mildly toxic. And an interesting trait that we need to talk about with wetland and um, aquatic plants is that many shade plants that live in wetlands or wetland adjacent areas can grow in full sun if they have water if they have enough water. So leather fern, for instance, can grow in full sun if it's got wet feet, but if it's only moist areas, it needs to be in the shade. The same thing with the white milkweed. It can grow in full sun, but it needs a lot more water than if it's in a moist shaded hammock. This guy is in zones 8A to 10B. You're not gonna find it in extreme South Florida. Um, it's really in North and Central Florida. And butter, it, each plant can support one to two caterpillars. It's not the biggest milkweed, but it's above average in size for the Asclepia family. And this one is a riparian species. I've seen it growing in several inches of water. Granted, it will not seed in water, 
but it will grow in water. And like many wetland plants, the seeds before the rainy season or right after the rainy season, the seeds just wait for a year. And it's short. By far, one of the showiest plants um, is Asclepius incarnata. I just like to say that. It's the swamp milkweed or the pink milkweed. Again, it's a host of the same three butterflies, but this one is big. It's three to four feet. And we actually grew this guy on a bunch of floating wetlands or floating islands. They were floating treatment wetlands to pull um, pollutants and garbage out of the water and nutrients out of the water, clean up the water before it hit our bays and estuaries. And guess what? When you grow a bunch of butterfly plants on a floating island, you get a bunch of butterflies in the middle of the water. They will fly over, lay their eggs on the island, fly back out, caterpillars will grow and pupate on these islands and then fly off and they'll take the nutrients of the plant that they ate with them. It's a really novel way to help clean up the water. And look at that. That's beautiful. Do not buy the tropical milkweed. It doesn't get as big as this. Tropical milkweed's actually harder to grow than this. This thing's huge. It gets like five to six caterpillars on each one. Huge clumps of pink flowers can grow in large groups is very aggressive and it loves wet to moist soils, that riparian habitat. It does not like to be underwater though. Like most wetland plants, it can survive being temporarily, like for a day or two underwater, but it needs that water to recede. Again, that ebb and flow. This one likes the flow a little bit more. It doesn't wanna be underwater. Our state wildflower and an excellent pollinator plant, Coreopsis leavenworthii is probably the most wet tolerant Coreopsis. I have seen these guys grow in several inches of water just fine. And that's actually something we might want to update on the Florida Native Plant Society list is that these guys are extremely water tolerant. I see them growing where no other Coreopsis ever will. And they also, I've seen them grow in a lot of part sun areas, especially in Deer Creek Prairie Preserve. Most of my experience is in Central and South Florida. So I'm sorry for those of you who know what that white stuff that hits the ground in the winter is. I'm not as experienced with that, but, ass but assume just like many East Coast plants where we share a lot of wetland plants. In fact, many of our species will extend all the way up to New York, such as the pickerel weeds or the cattails or the, um, some irises even, will extend across most of the East Coast. Plants that are perennials in Central and South Florida will be annuals in areas that snow heavily or get regular freezes. So that's something to keep in mind. And this is just a very showy plant and it blooms year round. It's one of the few wetland plants that really does. Excellent to add into any wetland or wildflower garden. Cluchea odorato, something that actually recently became available for purchase. I always thought it looked nice. It's a very fast growing pollinator plant. It's related to camphor weed and is often confused with it. This is the most wet tolerant Pluchea. It gets beautiful purple clusters of flower, grows in the absolute worst sandy soil. It loves to have wet feet, but it's surprisingly drought tolerant as well. And it really likes to grow in areas of bare soil. And when you talk about a lot of wetland plants, many of them are good at colonizing um, bare soils and areas. That's why a lot of wetland plants are considered aggressive or invasive. A native species cannot be invasive. It can be aggressive. It could be in a habitat that might not be right for it due to human interactions, but a native species cannot invade a habitat. It is simply the dominant or native species to that habitat, even if it's not doing what we want it to. This species is oftentimes called an invader, but it's a very showy seasonal wetland plant, most active in the spring, in my experience. And it's a really, really good um, species for attracting some pollinators, adding some color. It's purple. It's very nice. And it doesn't get that big. So if you live in South Florida, it'll be active year round. Central and North Florida, it goes winter dormant. Bacopa monieri, or the water hyssop. There's also another species, Bacopa caroliniana, um, I oftentimes show both in these presentations. They look very similar. Um, actually, I think that might be Bacopa caroliniana. They look very similar. The difference is one has slightly um, more, uh, slightly more clustered leaves and larger purplish blue flowers. They are both excellent ground covers with uh, Bacopa caroliniana being a much better ground cover while Bacopa monieri has larger flowers. Both Bacopas are host for the white peacock butterflies that you see everywhere. Those same butterflies also eat uh, frog fruit, 
Um, both are excellent wetland ground covers, but this one is very unique. It has an aquatic form. Many wetland plants have aquatic forms. In fact, um, these aquatic forms vary depending on the plant. Sometimes the plant will break off and float around on floating roots. And this is where you get floating weed mats and weed islands. And those of you in North Florida are lucky enough to get floating islands of carnivorous plants in your bogs and wetlands. And they're very, very use and they're very, very useful for you know controlling insects. This one is excellent as just a ground cover because underwater, when the rainy season hits, it's a great, beautiful bunch of plants underwater. It's good habitat for fish and amphibians, and it's just a beautiful thing. And then in the winter, when the water level goes down, this turns into a ground cover. So you don't have bare banks. You have less erosion in the winter. And that's when the butterflies really come to eat it. And it's full sun to part sun, and it will grow underwater as long as it has enough light. Anything that grows underwater is limited mostly by the amount of light it gets, not the depth. Though generally when you get deeper and deeper into the water, it's harder to see. But I have seen plants die from lack of light in a few inches of water that had a lot of sediment or pollutant or simply tannins, you know, the brown stuff in the water and a lot of the forests, they can't grow in that. But if it's very clear water, they can. This is one of the reasons water quality is so important for seagrass. If there's a lot of pollution coming out of the freshwater waterways and it's covering the seagrasses in sediment or dirt and the water gets all cloudy from boating or you know, people kicking up the sand in the mud, the seagrass can't grow in that. And it doesn't matter how much you plant if the water quality is bad. And that's another reason to have all these wetland plants is they act as a filter. They catch all that sediment, they catch all these plants. So if you wanna protect manatees, one of the best ways actually starts in your backyard. Put native plants everywhere. Canna flacida. Oh, that's an ugly caterpillar, but thankfully you'll never see them. That caterpillar actually you will never see because it will hide in the leaf, sew the leaf shut, and you'll never see it. That's a fact with all skipper butterflies. Um, that's actually the main characteristic of skippers is sewing leaves into little houses. And it's kind of cute. And the butterflies are um, orange, um, four obvious wings laid up. Very, very um, showy little butterflies. These get large yellow flowers, also known as the banana of the Everglade. And they have a max depth of six inches or less. I put these three dots here because uh, several counties published a few years ago that they could grow in 18 inches of water. Everyone who followed that rule lost their plants. They do not like being planted in deeper than six inches. In fact, they don't like six inches that much, but they can grow in it if they're planted large. A lot of people when they're planting um, aquatic areas actually get bare root plants. Because these plants are grown so powerfully from, rhizo from rhizomes, they have such strong root growth that you can break off a plant as long as it's got a little bit of a root bulb or any little bit of root, you can stick it in the mud somewhere else and it will grow. You can do a lot of things with aquatic plants that would make most people doing traditional gardening weep. If you wanna grow plants, if you wanna grow any of these wetland plants and you don't have a wetland and you don't have a pond and you don't want your water bill to go up as fast as housing prices are right now, what you need to do is get a tub or a bucket and just throw the plants in there. You can put some soil on it, but I actually grow um, several of my canna lilies, my fire flag, my bulrushes, some of my floating plants, my pickerel weed in tubs with a little tiny layer of soil at the bottom because I don't want them to root too much. And I throw a little chunk of fertilizer in a tub and that's it. That's really it. I put mosquito fish in the tubs too, just to keep the mosquitoes out, but that's it. It's just, it's not rocket science, people. It's plant science. Growing these wetland plants is wonderfully easy. Though a lot of the wildflowers, um, if they aren't a true wetland plant, like they're faculative wetland, like the um, milkweeds, this is probably, a, this is a true wetland plant. Anything that is riparian or emergent only is a obligate wetland plant. They can only grow in wetlands. They can be grown in the tubs. Uh, the milkweeds, anything that needs to be rooted in the soil is usually going to be more of a faculative wetland where they can grow in less wet areas, but they don't need to. And so you'll see a lot of those words thrown around, especially if you work in parks, preserves, or with the, uh, a lot of state agencies. But faculative means that they will use it. Obligate means they're only found there. This, is the, this plant is so difficult to grow from seed. You have to acid bathe it. Um, it, needs, it often requires gut scarification in the wild. It doesn't like to germinate underwater. It has low germination rates, no matter what process you use. 
just break one in half. I mean, I, I'll have a one gallon pot with five golden can in it. It is the easiest thing to grow, full sun, and it is native to almost all of Florida. Hymenicalis latifolia, the mangrove spider lily. We have a few different um, lilies native to Florida. This is one of my favorites. They bloom always in sets of twos. They have this delicate white membrane, and I see them in the wild growing on mangrove islands and spoil islands. They really do like part shade is where I see them do best. Technically, they can do full sun. Technically, they can do full shade, but part shade is ideal. They love it. Um, full sun, they tend to need a little bit more water, um, but that's kind of hard in a lot of the habitats they grow in, and they can tolerate salt water straight up. There are a lot of different salt tolerant plants and beach plants that are actually very rare. Um, something our company does is we do research and bring new plants into captivity or helping to um, bring plants that are underrepresented in the trade. And we work with a lot of, there's a good chunk of coastal plants that we want to bring back. And many of them are either host or pollinator plants to a wide variety of native and endangered butterflies and moths. Fun fact, if you have white or pastel colored flowers, that mostly attracts moths. And these guys will usually stay open at night. This is why you see, and that's because, you know, you can't, color doesn't, color, most of the light wavelengths for color are lost at night. And if you want butterflies, you want brightly colored flowers, not white as much. You want your yellows, your purples, your blues, your reds, your indigos, and all the other colors in the rainbow. And of course, these guys like calcareous soil and sand. They really, really like sand, scrum and sand. All right, there is a lot of floating plants, but the number one that I recommend for lakes is Nymphaea odorata or the fragrant water lily. Spatterdock, Mexican water lilies, and American lotus are all beautiful and great plants in their own right. And if you have aggressive algae issues, I recommend them over this. But if you just have a standard pond, and you want a water lily, and you don't want it to immediately take over your pond like a lot of the other ones will, they'll grow very quickly. This is one of the slower growing ones. This one gets big, beautiful yellow and white flowers. And looking at that picture, I know I have a lot better ones. I need to update some of the pictures in this presentation. And they are beautiful, gorgeous plants. And look, look how much of the water is shaded. This is, and also you see the ripples coming across the water and how they suddenly stop on the side of the lily pad. When you have erosion of pond banks, there's the rain coming from here, there's the waves coming from here, and you have animals trying to burrow into the side. If you're not stopping all three of those forms of erosion, you've lost, you lose your backyard, your house is in the pond. I have seen people, ATVs, golf courses, a tennis court fall into ponds. Please just plant plants everywhere, plant your native plants, and a very fascinating fact about these guys is that the female flower opens up first and they have a sticky pool of nectar in the inside of the flower. And when a butterfly or a pollinator comes to drink from it, they get stuck and they drown. And then after it takes the pollen off that insect, it opens up with the male flower. And it does this to ensure that it gets pollinated. It, they kill their pollinators sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. And it's often enough that scientists have documented that. And I just think that's cool. Also, if you want gallinules, which are lily walking birds or more hens, the birds with the very long toes, if you don't have lily pads and specifically a rush of some kind in your environment, you will be much less likely to get the birds. They walk on the lilies, they eat aquatic plants, and they use the rushes to build their nests. You can design and build your ecosystem for the wildlife you want to attract. And I know when we talk about wildflowers, you're like, Sean, that's a water lily. Well, it's wild. It's got flowers. Might not be what you traditionally think, but these plants have modified themselves in extreme ways to survive. And this is an example of the deepest uh, habitat that you'll get, the littoral habitat. All lilies tend to do best in full sun. Part shade is okay. Almost none of them grow in full sh shade. They really prefer full sun. And again, that is what you'd expect from their environment. They grow out in deep water. Very few trees can handle that deep water. And if you want a deep water tree environment, the only one you're going to see in the state of Florida is going to be cypress swamp. We have other kinds of swamps and things, but deep water, the only tree that really handles really deep water is cypresses. Oh, and of course, coastal mangroves, but I'm a freshwater guy. I can't afford to live on the coast. 
Sagittarius are one of the largest and most common groups of wetland plants that you'll see. Lancifolia or the duck potato, because we scientists just have an absolute blast naming these plants, um, is one of the most common. It's very attractive to birds. It's a deep water tolerant plant, up to two feet emergent, seeds readily, grows by cuttings, long, beautiful yellow flowering stalks, has a lot of lookalikes like uh, Sagittaria gram graminea or the grass leaved arrowhead looks like this, except instead of having that big um, like spearhead leaf, it's just like a stick. Fun fact, these are also widely used not only because they like deep water, which is good for how developers design ponds, get the gentle slope. You don't want a drop off. That's the worst thing you could do. We're not up north. We don't have cliffs. Florida is sand to the end. The longer you can have that slope, at least four or five to one, none of this two to one, none of this one to one, have a four to one or gentler slope, the better. And these guys are also used because they resist many common herbicides. So if a spray technician is going around spraying a pond, these resist glyphosate. They have a thick waxy leaf and just kind of shrug it off. A lot of herbicides actually don't work on all plants. And the ones that do tend to be very bad for the environment because guess what? They kill everything. If you're wanting to do management like that, you need to make sure you're using very specific herbicides and spot treating. You don't want to just spray everything. You're going to lose all the wonderful, beautiful plants native to the state. Pickerel weed or Pontideria cordata is a relative of the water hyacinth, but it doesn't float. And that's good. Um, it can sometimes grow on floating weed mats, um, but it's just, it's usually rooted. It is an excellent pollinator plant. It is the most utilized pollinator plant in any wetland that I've ever seen. If you, I recommend adding pickerel weed to every single wetland and lake garden. I know it's overused, quote unquote, and it's used in a lot of areas because it can tolerate deep water, but I have seen hundreds of different pollinators on these. I've seen giant swallowtails to tiny skippers. I've seen native bees to European bees to orchid bees. I've seen flies. I've even seen some of the beetles go after these. One of the best pollinator plants and it grows very well. Goes winter dormant though. Um, if you live in an area where it gets cold or it freezes, it'll die back down to the roots. If you live in central to south Florida, it might be active year round, but if we get a frost, it's going down and you just won't see it for a few months. Um, it's also eaten by a wide variety of animals. It is one of the few emergent plants, it's not an underwater plant, eaten by manatees. Manatees also eat water hyacinth. It's, they're the only native animal that actually has water hyacinth in its diet, and they eat it in South America because the West Indies manatee is, well, it's native to the West Indies. It's native to the whole Caribbean. It's a favored food by waterfowl and turtles and can get to a decent size. I've seen these guys stick three feet up, the, up out of the water, and... Just beautiful purple flowers. The largest wetland flower we have in the state, I believe goes to hibiscus coquineus or the scarlet hibiscus. Not only is it a host plant for all these butterflies, but that flower can be eight inches across, sometimes more. Usually it's around five to six, but I've seen some massive, massive flowers. They also have leaves that have the big palmate leaf structure. And so people think they look like marijuana, but it's not marijuana. And it's just kind of funny to let people think it is. It's a great thing to joke about. It's a beautiful pollinator plant. It's a great host plant. It can, it's a riparian plant. I've seen it tolerate slightly deeper depths and it is very, very winter dormant. I've seen this guy grow from south to central Florida. We have several other hibiscus species, each kind of native to a region of Florida. But this one, if you're in south or central Florida, grow this. Like a lot of plants, the leaves will change with the available sunlight and also the age of the plant. Um, so if it is in more sun, it gets this long, thin leaf characteristic. If it's in more shade, it has a thicker leaf. And so they're very versatile, very, very showy. I really recommend these, but don't make them the only thing you plant. Um, one, they go winter dormant. And two, like all ecosystems, you need some variety. And three, they don't look that good around the base. Like they have most of the flowers in the middle to the top of the plant. When you're an eight foot plant and only, you know, four or five feet of you looks good, put something around the bottom, put some irises, put some cord grass, put some, actually cord grass is the main thing that um, works with this species. Grass and sedges and rushes oper function very well for wildflowers in the ecosystem. A lot of grasses, rushes, and reeds will actually hold the flowers up. 
you ever seen the Florida tick seed in pots? It falls over all the time and it looks like trash. That's because in the wild, it relies on those grasses to give structure to it, to hold the flowers up so you can see it. And I don't know if you all are interested in wildflowers, but if you want them to look good, start adding some more grasses to your garden. That might be why you're not seeing as many flowers or your plants look like they're falling over all the time. It's because they don't have the structure they need in their ecosystem. And this is the, don't forget, I don't forget about you Northern folks. Um, if you're in North Florida, um, Pineland hibiscus. And yes, there's a Japanese species that looks very, very similar and they get confused all the time um, is the Pineland hibiscus. They have extremely large showy and white flowers with this like dark maroon center. They are easily, hibiscuses grow pretty well from seed or cuttings. Um, and this is another riparian plant. It is more cold tolerant to cochineus. And of the three wetland species we have, the other one being the salt rose mallow um, of hibiscus, this is the most cold tolerant. It's pineland hibiscus, swamp, uh, sorry, pink rose mallow, and then the scarlet hibiscus, if this is the state of Florida. Pineland, pink, scarlet. Um, like many hibiscuses, the flowers will close if it's too hot or in the dark to protect the flower core. Um, fun fact, magnolias do something similar where they close the flowers at night, but they actually close it to trap their pollinators because they are pollinated by beetles. Magnolias evolved before um, bees and butterflies did. So they use beetles and because beetles aren't very good pollinators, they close around them. Many wetland plants and many plants in general will close their flowers at night for a variety of reasons. If you want flowers that specifically open up at night, um, a great wetland species to use would be um, the night blooming water lily, Nymphaea jasmonia, which I'm hopefully going to help be introducing back into the trade and making more accessible. Uh, this is Sagittaria latifolia, the common arrowhead. Um, this is another reason why it's really important to make sure you know your species with water plants. Because there's so many different kinds of habitats in water, um, most of them are dictated by depth. So a difference of two inches in the water can sometimes be life and death for a plant. That's why most of the plants that I'm covering here can tolerate a range, um, but many, especially grasses and smaller wildflowers, really like those flatwood ecosystems that never flood more than an inch or two. Um, this one is very useful. It can grow in a good depth of six inches, has much wider leaves, has the same flower as the duck potato, and is great nesting sites for birds. Many ducks will nest in this. And um, I've noticed that uh, Sagittarius are good host plants for a lot of the moth species. And it's a, just an excellent little wildflower. I included only two non-wildflowers on this list because I think they're just some of my personal favorites. And I think that they're underused in the landscape. First off, I will just leave this over here. Button bush. Look at that flower. This is a small shrub to decent size, small to medium sized shrub. It's poisonous. So a lot of people have cut it off their properties or removed it. Has insanely beautiful flowers. I actually have a picture of one of these um, that I need to change in this presentation for a pink button bush in the wild. They're hosts to some of the largest native moths. They get beautiful flowers. And like many plants with these long tube shaped flowers, they attract hummingbirds and larger butterflies and moths. Um, they're extremely attractive. And if you don't have um, any livestock, I really recommend putting these in your wetland garden or um, your lakeside. They're very, very useful. They like that riparian habitat right next to the edge. Uh, they can handle flooding very well. A lot of forests and swamps have less wildflowers, but more shrubs and trees. And that's where this guy really shines. And many of those ecosystems also experience a lot of flooding. And they're full sun to part shade, though I have seen them grow in full shade. And again, a lot of wetland plants are very, very liberal in where they grow. They just like the water and the sun and soil requirements are less important. Not saying that they'll like, like this guy can't grow in pure beach sand, but it's less important for their habitat. And then of course, bald cypresses or the taxodiums. Bald and pond cypress are two of the best things to use in a wetland. Weirdly enough, they're native to almost the entire state, except historically Sarasota County. There are no old or known old cypress stands in the county, except for I believe on the very north, 
and the very eastern edges of the county. This tree, it, something about the soil, it just like it just never started growing here. It's an excellent um, tree. It's an, it's the only I would say the only littoral tree. It's the only tree that can grow in littoral environments, though it prefers ripland, riparian or upland, and you'll most often see it in that emergent zone. So between that six inches to two feet, and again. It really depends on the water. There are some cypress swamps that can see, you know, and some swamps that can see 10 feet in water changes because they're, you know, in floodplains or riverbeds. And this is the only tree that can handle that. They're also surprisingly drought tolerant. They feed a lot of birds. They're full sun to part sun. And cypress swamps are one of the most threatened wetland ecosystems besides bogs, um, I would say in the state. So they're definitely something that we should protect. And they're just, they're fairly showy. They're fairly low maintenance. They are also the most vulnerable species to herbicide treatments. Um, they are considered a indicator species for if there's a lot of pollution in an area. Very, very useful for a lot of habitat. That's why you see them alongside roads a lot is they grow very well in those ditches and the cypress knees don't push up pavement um, for the most part. They're not, they're like, they'll stick up into a yard but they don't, they can't push against rock very well. And I wanted to cover at least one truly submersed plant because a lot of them will, there's some Sagittarius that will stick their flowers up that live underwater, but this is one that a lot of people don't realize flowers. They have these small tube shaped flowers that just kind of look like a little tube and um, they send these flowers to the surface to be pollinated. Any angiosperm, which is a flowering plant, even if it lives its entire life underwater, must flower. And with the exception of seagrasses, all of them flower at the surface. And they are, these guys are mostly pollinated by um, aquatic insects and wave action, which is very unusual. You want aquatic plants as well. Not only do they help support and sequester a lot of nutrients and support the nutrient cycle, but they're good habitat for fish. They're eaten by birds, mammals, fish, and invertebrates. This is also something common in rivers and manatees eat it a lot. So if you live near a river, you're doing a river restoration. This is one of my top species I recommend. It's native to most of the state. It's a very useful species, and it, but it does depend a lot on clean and clear water. That's why like seagrasses, this is a plant that we're seeing less and less. And there are hundreds of wetland plants, and I am sure that I've missed a lot. There are some like cardinal flower, sky flower that I would love to cover, but there's just too many on this list. So there's some that you think that I 100% need to include or that you think would be interesting to include. I do this presentation a lot and I try to update it regularly. So let me know in the uh, chat or the comments and I'll try to answer and add that in. Last but not least, I shortened this for this presentation since these are non-flowering plants, but they're very important to cover. Horsetails are one of the most drought tolerant wetland plants that you're going to get. They love to grow in rip rap or rocky areas. You see them in bioswales a lot. Very useful. Also very interesting fact, they're related to ferns. That's their closest relative. And they were one of the first land plants. Kara, hornwort, um, and coontail are all similar kinds of plants, but they're not related at all. Like Kara is a macroalgae. Hornwort is a, uh, is a monocot. These plants are important because they release chemicals into the water that kill phytoplankton and they help clear and clarify the water. And they're also eaten by a wide variety of animals. Soft rush, um, I'm gonna lump a few of these together. Soft rush and Gulf spike rush are very important for water erosion control. And they're eaten by a wide variety of birds. They're used as nesting material. They're very useful. Giant bulrush is one of the best background drop plants you're gonna see. It gets nice showy seed heads and is very important for bird habitat. Starrush white top sedge is one of the few non true flowering plants. Like it's not gonna produce a showy flower that I think should be included in the wildflower foundation because it produces a flower like structure. It produces four white petals as a sedge, which is unusual. Very showy, also useful for supporting other wildflowers, especially I see it in a lot of areas with helenium or the sneeze weeds and a lot of the um, tick seeds and a lot of the you know more wet prairie species. Giant leather fern is just one of the most versatile ferns you can use. It can grow in salt water. It can grow in fresh water. It can grow in brackish water. It can't grow on a beach, but it can grow in like estuaries that get a lot of salt. 
It's I've seen it. I've seen it in mangrove swamps. It can grow in full sun to full shade. It's a big fern, great as a backdrop plant. A lot of wildlife uses it for cover. And if you ever just don't want to deal with an area that's in the shade and you're dealing with other invasives and you're like, what can I put here that I never have to look at this area again? Swamp fern. And grow almost anywhere, but prefers really moist, shady areas. It is very aggressive. Great for a bioswale. Great filter. It is very aggressive. If you're having a lot of like wild taro or elephant ear popping up in a habitat and you're like, I want to get rid of these invasives, but you know, I just can't keep coming and maintaining the site. I need something aggressive. Swamp fern. So this is um, a little bit just upcoming projects that Stocking Savvy is working on. I'm trying to let the public know. We're actually making and working with a variety of nonprofits to make and sell habitat restoration kits. And the Florida Wildflower Foundation is part of it. We're going to be including handouts on the in the kits. We're going to be including uh, more than two, but biodegradable pots. We're going to have a little box that you, we can ship to people, a little jar for cuttings and seed bombs, instructions, um, seed bombs for your area, a variety of seeds. We can customize the kits to some extent. And we're trying to do this so that people can do more backyard restoration. And right now we have a wet and a dry kit available. Um, just, you know, send us an email. We haven't made a ton of them yet, but we're working on massing up production. And basically it's just a way for people to get started in restoration in areas that are usually hard to get to, or maybe they don't live near a nursery. Or maybe you just want to give it to someone as a gift. Um, and we're also just trying to spread information about native plants as much as we can to as many people as we can. So we're happy that you all were um, putting in some pamphlets. We also work on bringing new native species into captivity like the American lotus. Um, that's one that we brought into captivity to, to, for commercialization um, so that people can use it for restoration. It's been grown in captivity before, but not um, on a commercial scale in over 20 years. So we worked on bringing that back. We're also working on working with species that are underutilized like Florida tick seed. So if there's any species that you want to see of wildflower that you're like, why isn't this wetland wildflower grown? Well, let me know. We might be able to grow it and help work with nurseries to sell it. We have a small nursery in Sarasota County, Native Harvest. That's on our website. But outside that county, we are either shipping or working with your local nurseries to help do restoration. We also have a monthly newsletter on our website. Um, for restoration, news, and volunteer opportunities. Big thing going on right now that we are trying to tell people is that there is a disease affecting turtles in Florida, starting in South Florida, likely a release from a, a turtle farm or the pet trade that is killing native turtles in large amounts. Stocking Savvy is currently not stocking turtles, and we encourage everyone to not move turtles. And if you see a sick turtle, one that's obviously not moving away from you, one that looks very unhealthy, to please call FWC. Or you can let me know and I'll call FWC. There's also the City Nature Challenge. That's just a fun thing that you can participate anywhere in the world. Go find plants and animals near you. That's April 29th to May 2nd. And if you need my contact information, it's right there, stockingsavvy at gmail.com. Or you can reach out to me at 941-500-2218. We do restoration projects all over the state, and we're happy to be a resource for people with wetland questions or aquatics questions. We oftentimes help people with plant and animal IDs as well. Thank you all for listening, and now we can go to a Q&A. Right. Thank you, Sean. That was uh, a lot, a lot of good information. Um, we do have a few questions, um, and I know we are at three o'clock, but um, if everyone can just hang on for a few minutes, we can get a few questions answered. Um, Diane asked if the cooters that you mentioned in the beginning of the pro pro program uh, will eat cattails. Mm, they'll bite them, but they'll mo they won't damage them. They won't do enough to kill. Cattails grow too fast. All right. Um, Becca asked if you have any tips on hydrilla removal. The, there are no herbicides that actually kill hydrilla. They only burn it down in the water column. That's because hydrilla has three parts, a tuber like a potato, the leaves and stems, which can break off and form a whole new plant. And then a unique thing to hydrilla called a turian, which is an armored leaf that it shoots into the soil if it feels herbicide or it's stressed out. Nothing, no herbicide hits all three. The only long-term solution is grass carp. And that's something that you have to get a state permit for, but it's the best thing to do. And it's the only thing that actually works. I was at the Aquatic Weed Conference 2018. No one had a solution that was long-term other than that or or every month herbicide applications. Wow. Um, 
Marilyn asked where she can purchase native Florida snails to help control the algae in her pond. Do you know? So native Florida are? snails are something we're working on sourcing. Um, they're one of the hardest things we've gotten. Um, most of the things that we work with are fish just because the fish are more copper resistant, which is a big problem in stormwater ponds. And they also aren't confused for the invasive apple snail, which a lot of people get confused about. So we usually use things like shiners, chub suckers, flagfish, and the flagfish is, you could say, the flagfish of our operation. Um, it's native to the entire state. Every single county has red and white stripes, the little blue star, and it eats mostly filamentous algae. And so what better way to fight nutrient pollution and the red tide than the American freedom fish? And it's only found in Florida. So that's my recommendation for that. It's just so hard to get the apple snails, but we also stock a variety of other um, invertebrates and fish that eat algae. Great. And I should say, we will uh, be sending out that resource sheet that I mentioned earlier, and we'll have links to all the things that Sean is referencing, including his contact information and website. So um, you guys can have, have access to him. Um, Sandy said that Lakeshore cleaning companies advertise that um, there are safe and effective EPA certified aquatic herbicides kill off invasives with no adverse effects. Can you speak to um, why that why that's wrong or why that may not be true? So there are only 14 herbicides licensed for aquatic use. Half of them were grandfathered in because we did, had nothing else. All modern herbicides that pass EPA standards do follow that. They are extremely environmentally sensitive. They there are actually several herbicides that were invented in the last 20, 30 years that actually improve cypress tree growth and only target very specific species or certain kinds of plants. That is not the species that were grandfathered in. If they are using copper sulfate or chelated copper, that is one of the worst things for the environment. A lot of people talk about glyphosate and Roundup. That's not even in my top five most harmful herbicides that we use. Copper sulfate is the one thing you should ban. Glyphosate's like eight or nine on the list. And that's mostly for the effects that it has on people. And the fact that we've been using it for so long that a lot of the plants that we spray it with just aren't affected by it anymore. They've grown resistant. Um, dimethyl aniline or DMA is another one that I have a lot of hesitation about because it is known carcinogen. And again, it's a lot of these older herbicides that were grandfathered in. Herbicide management is actually a relatively new thing. It can be done right, but there's a lot of limitations to it, which is why, and honestly, one of the biggest reasons to not do it is just the fact that plants will eventually grow to resist most herbicides. So use it as a last resort, only when every other tool at your disposal has been used and failed. Great. Um, Athena asked, uh, and you talked about growing plants in a bucket or in a pot, and she asked, how do you keep the water from growing stagnant while you're growing these plants? So that's the thing. You can also let the water ebb and flow in the pot, but a lot of wetland plants don't care. They are fine with stagnant water. In fact, many wetland plants will grow in stagnant water. Some do not like it. Um, there are some that don't. Liz, um, scorp uh, sorry, uh, Cardinal flower is one that I know that doesn't do well with stagnant water. And that's one I'd prefer just grow in a moist system. But most of your emergent or littoral plants that like to grow in like ponds, they're fine with stagnant water. They're used to it. That's what they're growing in the wild. And they will never, ever mold. They love that. They'll grow in the hydrogen sulfide bacteria. You can't kill them if you tried. Well, you can kill them, but it's pretty hard. <laughs> um, both um, Lana and uh, Kat are asking, not Kat, I'm sorry. Um, Marilyn, Lana and Marilyn are both asking about protecting plants as you're establishing them from the ducks and geese and the other animals that might eat them. Do you have any recommendations for that? My recommendation is do the whole thing at once. So when you go to a retail store to buy, say, a duck potato, it's about $5. That's because, you know, people are handling it. It's an individual. It's in a big pot. You plant that duck potato on your shoreline, it gets eaten in a heartbeat. But if you plant a whole lake, like on average, my projects cost per acre of shoreline or lake restoration, $2,500. The plants, when you get them on scale, cost between 50 cents and a dollar for full-size plants. So my recommendation is just do the whole shoreline at once. Do the economy of scale. Get some volunteers out there. Pay a company to do it. That's the best thing to prevent that. The, otherwise, you're doing cages. You're doing um, a lot of different work and putting all your plants at once. 
And I know with a lot of people who are gardening, they're like, what? You're just throwing everything in? And I'm like, yes, because otherwise it gets eaten. The, the aquatic gardening throws a lot of the traditional rules of horticulture right out the window. In fact, I'm a terrible traditional horticulturist. My nursery manager asked me to water some cactuses. Every single one of them was overwatered. I'm not a good standard horticulturist, but I'm great with aquatics. And they require many different sets of skills. So just do a bigger project. Go, go nuts. Go ham to the wall. And you can get a lot of plants in bulk very cheaply. All right. Um, let's see. Two more questions for you. Can you speak a little bit about the American lotus and how it is propagated or how to germinate the seeds? I think you did mention it needs scarification or acid. So the American lotus is very tricky. We actually worked with Naples Botanical Garden to learn how to grow it. And this is, and you could buy the seeds for like a few dollars online. We even sell the seeds ourselves. Um, and if you buy them from us, they're pre-scarified, but you have to go to the side of the seed with the air bubble, take some pliers, pry that air bubble off and specifically plant it in four inches of water for best results. And if you're going to be growing it in a tub, it has to be a tub without drainage. Like if you're growing it in a pot in a tub or in a lake or something, because you want to move it later, you have to put it in a pot without holes because if the roots go outside those holes, they break. If you don't, and if you put it in a pot that's too small or a square pot or a tray, um, hard rough corners will actually break the roots. I found that the best, from our research project, the best thing to put them in was a, th at minimum, a three gallon pot, though five gallon pots just to start and grow these was best. Yeah. From seed. Mm -hmm. And we also had to put netting over them to keep out raccoons and birds and things. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend is try to get um, a good variety of seed and see them along a waterway. As long as at least one lotus takes off, you'll have them for years. They are very, very strong rhizomal growers and you'll get lots of flowers and seed. Great, okay, um, last question. Um, any recommendations for books about native aquatic plants? Ooh, um, the IFAS office has some great guides. There's also, um, I'm always a fan of the Peterson guides. Um, Priceless Florida is actually one of my favorite books. It goes very in depth on a lot of these ecosystems. Um, but really because there's so many different kinds of wetlands, swamps and habitats, you really kind of got to figure out where you're at and what habitat you want to mimic before I recommend a book. Um, it also depends on what you want. If you want primarily a butterfly garden, I might actually look more for a butterfly book and then pick the host plants that you want, like this poster behind me. Each butterfly is lim linked to a host plant and then just make just pick the habitat best for that host. Um, so Priceless Florida is probably one of my favorites. Um, then of course, um, there's several different water gardening books. But the IFAS office has some really good guides on water gardening. Great, and we've got that link in our resource page too that we'll be sending out, so. Um, okay, well, we are at just about 3.15, which is a little bit longer than normal, but I think this has been really informative and um, I definitely wanna thank you, Sean, for taking the time to talk with us and um, just give such good information on the area that I don't think gets a lot of coverage. Of course, and thank you, Stacy. Sorry the presentation went a little long, but I get excited. No, <laughs> good information is, is what we want. So um, I just, you know, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, no apologies. This has been awesome. Um, and I said earlier, this is being recorded. So we will have this up on our website and YouTube channel in probably 24 hours or so. And we'll include a link to that in the email that we send out to all who attended today. So um, thank you all. Don't forget next, next month, we have uh, Sandy Wilson on... Uh, some underutilized ornamental natives. So um, check out our website to sign up for that one too. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. Thank you all for coming. Plant natives, put more things in your ponds than just a duck potato, picker weed, and knotted spike rush. And really that gentle slope, having lots of natives, there's so much diversity you can do. And once you start getting into it, you'll realize that most ecosystems in Florida have wetland elements. And once you start learning how to work with that, you're gonna see more species than you ever would have believed. Awesome, great advice. Thanks. <laughs>